Hey everyone, before we get started, I just want to take a minute to showcase the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. NordVPN specializes in, what else, VPNs, or virtual private networks, which allow internet users across the land to surf the web, as the cool kids say, in peace and comfort. These e-streets are dangerous, you know? Hackers, government agencies, bad takes on Twitter, NordVPN can protect you from those first two things, and that's pretty good in my book. But having a VPN is like casting Reflect around your data, except this spell lasts for as long as you want it to. Whether you like it or not, your data can be bought and sold, and having a VPN can stop that process dead in its tracks. On top of that, NordVPN can help you lift restrictions on content that's only available in certain countries or territories. And as it should, because I think we should all have access to the same garbage regardless of where we live, don't you? To further drive home my point, Kingdom Hearts characters who definitely have a VPN. Tron, for sure, the guy probably grew up with people who became VPNs. Master Xehanor, the man plans for every eventuality, and you need virtual security if you're gonna do that. Characters who don't use VPNs, Ansem the Fool, and King Michael. These guys thought that just because they opened a private window they were safe, and their ISPs still collected their data and ruined their days. So let's succeed where they failed. Go on and visit nordvpn.com slash regularpat or use the code regularpat to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with, naturally, a hearty discount. Go do that while my jingle plays and I talk about boring intro stuff. It'll make me real happy and you won't regret it. You asked for it, so here it is, the Kingdom Hearts 2 Heartless and Nobody Compendium. Just like my video on the KH1 Heartless, we'll be taking a look at each and every non-boss enemy in Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix and going over their attacks, item drops, reaction commands, their best locations for farming, and anything else that bears mentioning. Once again, we'll have stats on the screen giving you the most pertinent information, including this bar at the bottom showing which worlds each enemy shows up in. A small note, since almost all of them show up in the Colosseum Cups this go-around, I'm only going to show Olympus if they actually appear in the world proper and can be farmed for items. For the purposes of this project, we're splitting the game into two phases, which are essentially pre- and post-Battle of 1000 Heartless. When it comes to population and best rooms for spawns, I'm only including repeatable encounters and not events or the spawn sets on your initial visits to each world. Otherwise, we'd be here forever. We're gonna be here forever anyway, but I'm glad to be here forever with you. So let's go. Making its grand return from KH1, and Chain of Memories I guess, is the Shadow, first encountered when summoned by Pete at the Mysterious Tower. Not much has changed for these guys, if anything they seem a little bit smaller and even less threatening than the last outing. They still have the same propensity to sink into the floor and attack with simple jab moves. Annoyingly, KH2 adds Dark as a synthesis property in addition to Lucid, which was what Shadows used to be associated with. In KH2, Shadows have a 4% chance of dropping Dark Shards and are best found in the Savannah in the early game with about 15, and Michael's House in the late game with with about 14. Second only to Shadows and getting historically slaughtered in droves, it's another returning Heartless, the Soldier, first appearing in the Mysterious Tower. You would think after the catastrophic loss this subspecies experienced in KH1 that Soldiers would stop enlisting, but alas, there are apparently great incentives to join the Heartless Armed Forces. The Soldier's most prominent new feature in KH2 is their ability to get their ass beat by harnessing their janky energy via the Cyclone Reaction Command, which allows Sora to counter the Soldier's own retaliating kick with a swift dive attack. Otherwise, they still attack with simple swipe moves and a new vertical spinny attack. Soldiers drop Dark Shards at a rate of 8% and Bright Shards at 4%. They're best found in the West Hall of Beast Castle in the early game with about 14 spawns and like the Shadows in Michael's House in the late game with 7. For whatever reason, the large body is always invited back to these games, presumably because the Square Enix executives are afraid of being belly flopped into submission if they don't comply. First appearing in Beast Castle and mostly being associated with that world in Cage 2, large bodies are a bit more agile than last time as they've added a new move to the repertoire in which they aggressively slide towards you on their tummies like morbidly obese penguins. This can be blocked with a built-in guard reaction command and followed up with a rapid attack called Kickback, which involves little to no monetary payment for the large body. Sora can also swat a mid-air large body out of the air with the full swing command, sending it flying and questioning its purpose on this earth. Otherwise, they still use their usual charging move from KH1, as well as their sad swipe attack and jumpy shockwave move. Just like last time, the large body's jiggly belly full of trans fats is somehow impervious to damage, so aim for the back. Their most common drop is the Power Shard with a 12% drop rate, and rarer drops include High Potions with a 10% chance and Serenity Shards with a 4% chance of dropping. Early game, the best place to farm them is the Entrance Hall in Beast Castle, where there are 4 spawns per visit. The best places to farm them in the late game are the Building Site and Scene of the Fire in Timeless River, or alternatively, the Ballroom and Secret Passage in Beast Castle, all of which spawn about 3 per visit. 
The first of the new Cage 2 prismatic melodies is the Silver Rock, which is sort of like the Platinum Presto, but not as interesting or marketable. It's also more of a white than a silver, quite frankly, I just don't like being lied to. Introduced in Agrabah, the Silver Rock's element is, I'm assuming, light, which I'm cool with since we hadn't seen that yet. Silver the Rock Johnson has a few attacks, including close-range physical moves and attacks that generate shockwaves or small blasts of light. Sora can take advantage of the latter and use the Shift Shot Reaction command to give the Rock a taste of its own medicine, and the medicine tastes like explosions. Their most common drop is a Power Stone that has a 6% chance of dropping, their rarer drop is the Bright Stone with a 3% chance. The best place to farm them in the early game is the Cave Entrance in Agrabah with 6 spawns per visit. Late game, the best place is the Valley of Stone in Agrabah with 10 spawns. The next prismatic melody is the Emerald Blues, which cleverly gets away with just being a color twice. First appearing in Halloween Town in a much more muted color scheme, the Emerald Blues specializes in arrow magic, which is, again, welcome, as the KH1 members of the family lack this representation. This is building up to something. The Blues can attack with a basic arrow spell, much like a shortened version of the spell that Sora could cast in KH1 before Naminé forgot to give that knowledge back to him. In addition to the occasional ramming attack, the Blues will also use a much larger tornado move when it's feeling threatened. Their most common drop is a Lightning Stone at a 10% chance, and their rarer drops are Energy Gems with a 4% chance. Their best pre-1000 Heartless Spot is the Curly Hill in Halloween Town with 8 spawns. Late game, the best place to farm them is the Valley of Stone in Agrabah with 7 spawns per visit. The Emerald Blues has a Final Mix exclusive variant called the Spring Metal, which only appears in the Cavern of Remembrance. I should know, I'm just going to group these variant Heartless with each other in this video, even though they appear later in the journal in their own group. The Spring Metal is stupid because Spring isn't a color, and nothing about the word Metal invokes the element of air. The most common drop for these blue swirly boys are Remembrance Gems with a 10% chance. Their rarer drops are Serenity Gems with a 4% chance. They only appear in the Cavern's Engine Room with 15 spawns. Up next is a bastard who you and I both hate, the Crimson Jazz. First found in Radiant Garden immediately after your first visit to Space Paranoids, the Crimson Jazz sucks and is bad. I should say, I like Crimson as a color, and I think Jazz is totally fine. You'd think that'd make a cool combination, but this pairing makes for a shitting pile of dick, and also fuck. First of all, we already had a fire guy. The Red Nocturne was doing its job just fine. This thing is redundant. The Crimson Jazz is just the Red Nocturne, but if it was a fat-ass monstrosity that's hell-bent on smothering you with both of the fire and the flames. They can conjure up small airborne mines to surround you, as well as make these three big fireballs to chase after you. In addition, it can attack with a swingy kick move, as well as expel fiery fumes in a shockwave attack. And obviously, don't use fire on it. The Crimson Jazzes have a 12% chance of dropping a Blazing Crystal, a 5% chance of dropping a Mega Aether, and a 4% chance of dropping a Serenity Stone. They only appear in the late game, the best place to farm them being the West Hall and Beast Castle, where 9 spawn. Inexplicably back from KH1 is the Air Pirate, which at least explicably first appears in Port Royal, probably wondering when and why Peter Pan got such a gritty reboot. Air Pirates are still martial arts enthusiasts, attacking with kicks and charging punches or uppercuts. It has a reaction command, which, full disclosure, I had never once used until this project because it has a pretty specific window and Air Pirates generally aren't that common. But once the Air Pirate starts up that classic move where he points and announces his intent to attack you, you can face it and then wait for it to get close to use the Air Twister reaction command in which you grab it by the foot and swing it around a bit. The Air Pirates have an 8% chance of dropping a Dark Crystal and a 4% chance of dropping a Bright Crystal. The best place to farm them early game is the town in Port Royal, where 6 will spawn. Late game, the best place to farm them is either the Checkpoint or the Village Cave in Land of Dragons, where 3 spawn. The Air Pirate also has a powered-up version in the Cavern of Remembrance called the Aerial Viking, which really does nothing to evoke thoughts of Vikings. I mean, I guess Vikings are just pirates, but in colder weather, but I don't know. I would've gone with, like, Aerial Buccaneer or something. They're pretty much exactly the same, but stronger. They have a 6% chance of dropping a Remembrance Stone and a 4% chance of dropping a Serenity Stone. You can find 8 of them in the Engine Room. Here we have the Trick Ghost, which either has two sets of eyes or one set of eyes and a set of nipples that looks just like its eyes, which, don't we all? The Trick Ghost first appears in the Underworld, and it sort of has two forms, although it's mostly just changing its posture, switching from knuckle-dragging mode to candle-holding mode, which gives it different attacks depending on its status. It can shoot dark fire at you in singles or triples, strike you with its lit candle, or whip you with its hair hat in a manner that fully inspired Willow Smith's 2010 hit single. Due to its association with fire moves, the Trick Ghost is fittingly immune to fire magic. The Trick Ghosts have a 10% chance of dropping a Lucid Shard and 4% chance of dropping an Energy Stone. The best place to farm them early game is the Lost Road in Olympus Coliseum, where 5 spawn. Late game, the best place to farm them is Candy Cane Lane or the Hinterlands in Halloween Town, where 3 spawn. They also have a more powerful variant in the Cavern of Remembrance called the Magic Phantom. It attacks in pretty much the same manner, but has different defensive properties. When it's floating around, it can only be damaged by magic, whereas you need to use physical attacks when it's grounded. They have a 10% chance of dropping a Remembrance Stone, and a 4% chance of dropping a Serenity Stone, and you can find 9 in the depths. Up next is the Rabid Dog, which was later changed to Bad Dog in subsequent appearances, so as not to offend the folks out there who deeply tie their sense of self to having rabies. 
I'm kidding about why they changed it, but not kidding about those people existing. You can go ahead and Google rabies pride in another tab while I talk about this mutt. The rabbit dog is sort of like Cerberus in that it's a dog that guards the underworld but with two fewer heads that it lost in two separate but equally tragic accidents. They honestly kind of suck and just loaf around but will occasionally hit you with a bork attack. You ever have a dog with just a super loud and obnoxious bark that pierces the heavens and your eardrum? That's the rabid dog's main method of attack. They'll also pounce at you and bite, and, you know, give you rabies, which can only be cured by a high mega elixir, and good luck finding one of those in this economy. The best place to farm them in the early game is the Cave of the Dead entrance in Olympus Coliseum, where 10 of them will spawn. In the late game, the best place is the harbor in Port Royal, where 6 spawn. Here we have the Hook Bat, which is disappointingly not Captain Hook wielding a baseball instrument. The Hook Bat has no time or tolerance for any form of pretense. It is a bat with a hook, and nobody can say that they were not properly warned. Native to Beast Castle, the Hook Bat often appears in large groups so they don't feel lonely when they're slaughtered with ease. You can harness the power of their tears with the Bat Cry command to literally just grab one and beat the shit out of its family members with his own body. Sora's like, bro, I don't even need a Keyblade, I'm huge and you're a little baby bat. Bats can't do shit. This will come back to bite him in 2019, and not in the KH3 way. The Hookbat has a supersonic wave attack and a physical flippy tackly move, but it seriously doesn't matter because it was dead before you could notice either. Hookbats have a 6% chance of dropping a Frost Shard and a 3% chance of dropping a Bright Shard. Best place to farm them in the early game is the West Wing and Beast Castle, where 14 of them will spawn. Late game, the best place is the Sandswept Ruins in Agrabah, with 20. The Hookbat also has a Cabin of Remembrance cousin called the Befuddler, that's 2Fs 1D, which also describes my first semester of Algebra 2. Befuddle is a synonym for confuse, and I am indeed confused as to why the Hookbat thought being a different color would make it any more difficult to murder. They have a 6% chance of dropping a Remembrance Shard and a 3% chance of dropping a Serenity Shard. They can only be found in the depths, where 20 of them will spawn. Up next is this nerd, the Bookmaster, which is reading the script for the next part of the Crocodile Timeline. The Bookmaster first appears during your return trip to Radiant Garden before your first Space Paranoids visit. Fittingly, it's sort of a successor to the Hollow Bastion-based wizard from KH1, just with an English major instead. When it's not spending its time looking for a job that puts its degree to use, the Bookmaster casts Fire, Blizzard, and Thunder Magic, as well as attacking its enemies with a flurry of paper cuts. Unsurprisingly, the Bookmaster is immune to any non-magnet or reflect magic, so don't do that. I mean, you could. I can't stop you. The Bookmasters have a 10% chance of dropping a Lucid Gem, a 4% chance of dropping an Energy Crystal, and a 1% chance of dropping an Akashic Record. The best place to farm Bookmasters both pre- and post-Battle of a Thousand Heartless is the Burrow and Radiant Garden, with 8 and 10 of them spawning, respectively. The Bookmaster has a relative in the Cavern of Remembrance called the Rune Master. You would think from the name it's reading like an ancient scripture, but it's actually just looking at a cosmopolitan quiz about whether it's more cute or hot. They basically attack with more powerful versions of the Bookmaster spells, and their book is also impervious to damage because knowledge is defense. They have a 10% chance of dropping a Remembrance Gem, a 4% chance of dropping a Serenity Gem, and a 1% chance of dropping an Akashic Record Plus. They're only encountered in the Engine Room, where 9 of them will spawn. Next up is the Minute Bomb, although I think it's the Minute Bomb because it's small, and Minute Bomb would be a misnomer considering its timer maxes out at 9 seconds. First appearing during the Siege on Disney Castle, the Minute Bomb is an egg that someone smarter and more twisted stuck an explosive inside and then said, Go nuts, kid. Half of its attacks feature it counting down to its own death, and the other half is a pathetic headbutt move. Back in the day of Vanilla Cage 2, the Minute Bomb was the only way to relive the glory of rolling around in the dirt in Cage 1, as its self-destruct move opened up the opportunity to use the Dodge Roll Reaction command to sabotage its suicide and escape the explosion. You can also cast fire on it to speed up the process of lighting its fuse. The Minute Bombs have a 6% chance of dropping a Blazing Shard and a 3% chance of dropping a Bright Shard. The best place to farm them early game is Lilliput in Timeless River, where 12 of them will spawn. Late game, the best place is the Valley of the Dead in Olympus, where 9 will spawn. Next up is the Hammer Frame, which is pretty much just a Pokemon. Probably Steel type with a high attack stat, and uh, it evolves into a Jackhammer. Call me Game Freak, unless Square Enix feels like answering my emails first. The Hammer Frame first appears in Timeless River, where it'll attempt to flatten Lilliput in efforts to clear the way for a Walmart. If it wasn't abundantly clear, the Heartless are exclusively sponsored by Walmart. The frame attacks by creating shockwaves or just being generally hammerly, but, you know, just, just hit it. The Hammer Frames have a 10% chance of dropping a Blazing Shard and a 4% chance of dropping an Energy Stone. Best place to farm them early game is Michael's House in Timeless River, where 6 of them will spawn. Late game, their best location is the Secret Passage in Beast Castle, where 6 will spawn. The Hammer Frames Cavern variant is called the Iron Hammer, a poorly fleshed out Marvel villain if I've ever heard one. Sorry for being redundant and saying poorly fleshed out and then Marvel villain in the same sentence. They have a 10% chance of dropping a Remembrance Shard and a 4% chance of dropping a Serenity Shard. The only place to farm them is the Depths in the Cavern, where 15 of them will spawn. 
Introducing the Bulky Vendor, aka what if we turned a Chuck E. Cheese diversion into a Heartless. As the game states, when you enter a room containing one, the Bulky Vendor is a rare Heartless, and its only real function is dispensing out prizes non-violently. Like the White Mushrooms from KH1, these guys all have set locations and a handful of worlds where they may or may not spawn. These locations and worlds all post 1000 Heartless are the Checkpoint in the Land of Dragons, the West Hall at Beast Castle, the Cave of the Dead entrance in Olympus Coliseum, the Bazaar in Agraba, and Candy Cane Lane in Halloween Town. If you enter one of these areas and the vendors don't show up, just try one of the other four until they do. The game will give you an information prompt in the top left, and you might even catch a glimpse of the vendors before they teleport away. In order to get them to reappear, you need to destroy or interact with some objects in the area. The fireworks at the checkpoint, the knight statues in the West Hall, the torches in the Cave of the Dead, the stalls in the Bazaar, and the merry-go-rounds on Candy Cane Lane. Upon doing this, the bulky vendors will pop back up alongside a couple of bodyguard Heartless. Regardless of whether or not you defeat them, you can now use a reaction command on the vendors to get a prize. Upon reappearing, the vendor's HP drains on its own, and the command you can use on it depends on how much HP remains. Capsule prize from full health to 75%, a rare capsule from 74 to 50%, a limited capsule from 49 to 25%, and prime capsule from 24 to 1%. As you might expect, the lower the HP gets, the better the prizes are, but the vendor becomes faster and more slippery as time goes on. Regardless of which command you use, the vendor will always drop a serenity item, and that'll be a shard, stone, gem, or crystal as the commands get progressively better. In addition, you have a chance of getting an oracalcum that gets better as the HP gets lower. That's an 8, 10, 12, and 16% chance as the commands change. For whatever reason, bulky vendors appear in the Hades Paradox Cup even though they won't drop prizes. Otherwise, they only appear in the places I've listed. One in Land of Dragons and Beast Castle, and two in the other worlds. Here we have the Fortune Teller, which apparently did not predict its own demise, otherwise why would literally any of them ever show up to a fight, unless they're trying to commit suicide by Sora. Native to Agrabah, the Fortune Teller uses its Crystal Ball less for Nostradamusing and more for bludgeoning you. The Fortune Teller is also a Blizzard Magic Specialist, as it'll conjure up icicles to shoot at you, as well as attempt to freeze you with a countdown attack. Sora can actually just grab the timer and fling it back at the Fortune Teller with the Clear Shot Reaction command. Fittingly, Fortune Tellers are immune to Blizzard, but I bet even you could have predicted that. Fortune Tellers have a 10% chance of dropping a Frost Gem and a 4% chance of dropping an Energy Gem. Best place to farm them early game is the Bazaar in Agrabah, where 6 will spawn, and late game the best place is the Sandswept Ruins, where 9 spawn. Some enemies have guns, other enemies are the guns. This includes the Cannon Gun, which is exactly what it says on the tin. The Cannon Gun naturally first appears in Port Royal, and its attacks involve shooting you directly in the face, shout out to Clayton, or just dropping bombs directly on your head, signaled by the well-branded Heartless Reticle on the ground. They're mainly cowards who hang out on the sidelines and attack from afar, although almost never on behalf of Jafar. These bomb-hurling nuisances have a 6% chance of dropping a Blazing Stone and a 3% chance of dropping a Bright Stone. Before the Battle of 1k Heartless, you can best find them in the Moonlight Cavern of Port Royal with 7 spawns, afterwards they're best found at the summit of the Land of Dragons with 5. The Cannon Gun has a cavernous cousin called the Camo Cannon, although you can't see its torso here. They're only found in the depths portion of the cave where 21 spawn, and they have a 6% chance of dropping a Remembrance Shard and a 3% chance of dropping a Sher Serenity Shard. It's a Serenity Shard, you see? You can consider this next one the Shadow of the Sky. It's the Rapid Thruster, which is in contention for horniest sounding Heartless name. Alright, quick top 5. Uh, Magnum Loader, Assault Rider, uh, screwdriver, Hot Rod, Rapid Thruster. There, just saved us a 2023 video. Rapid Thrusters consistently appear in swarms, either small ones in the field or big and literally endless ones during event battles like here in the Land of Dragons where you'll first encounter them. They attack with quick front-facing beak strikes as well as a slower backwards propeller move, but they're really not even that dangerous even when fighting hundreds at a time. Their case is not helped by the opportunity to use the Speed Trap Reaction command followed by the Arrow Blade command to yeet a multitude of thrusters away from you. Rapid Thrusters have a 4% chance of dropping lightning shards upon defeat, and their best early game location is the Village Cave in the Land of Dragons where there are 10. Later on, their most consistent spot is the Sandswept Ruins in Agrabah where there are 20, but they can potentially spawn in a huge swarm atop the peak in the Pride Lands, although that only happens 25% of the time when you enter the room. If you're lucky, there'll be 226, and if not, there'll be 1. How did I figure out how many of them are in that swarm? I have my ways. Fun fact, Driller Moles were actually holdovers from a world based on The Incredibles, which would have taken place after the first movie and entailed the Underminer controlling a legion of Heartless which predominantly featured Driller Moles. Plans for the world eventually fell through and then they just kind of shoved the Driller Moles into Halloween Town and other worlds. None of that was true, but it kind of sounds like it could have been, right? Driller Moles, unsurprisingly, drill in and out of the ground to both maneuver and attack, as well as just stab you in the face by jumping at you. They are little idiots and have never been more than a minor nuisance to anyone. Driller Moles drop Lightning Stones at 6% and Bright Stones at 3%, and they're best found at the Curly Hill before the 1k Heartless Battle where 15 spawn. 
Afterwards, it's either the Valley of the Dead or the Underworld Cavern's entrance with seven. Next up is the Lance Soldier, whose name is a clever reference to it being a soldier who wields a lance. First and most often appearing in Beast Castle, the Lance Soldier is technically two entities since the actual lance seems to be at least semi-sentient, but they both die just the same. Although, for whatever reason, it's immune to thunder, so don't do that. It's a very janky boy, attacking with dash moves and a whirling dervish attack that leaves it dizzy. When its health gets low, the lance will take control and lift the soldier half into the air and zip around, but you can also occasionally grab the lance yourself and fly around wildly before slamming in the ground, damaging the lance soldier and anything else in the vicinity. The reaction command for this is called Lance Tug. Real quick, top 5 horniest reaction command. The Lance Soldier drops Frost Shards at 10% chance per kill and Energy Stones at 4%. They're best found in the entrance hall of Beast Castle in the early game with 6 spawns and at the town in Port Royal with 7 after 1000 Heartless. The Lance Soldier also has a cavern variant called the Lance Warrior. I guess all warriors are soldiers, but not all soldiers are warriors, as the Lance Warrior is literally just the Lance Soldier, but stronger and golder. They drop Remembrance Stones at 10% per kill and Serenity Stones at 4%, and you can find 8 of them in the Engine Chamber. Up next is the Morning Star, which always loves sports. Volleyball was the best, of course, he was the ball. Morning Stars first show up when you're returning to Radiant Garden for the Space Paranoids episode, and its name is a reference to the medieval club-like weapon that it resembles. It'll attack by flailing its arms, spinning around like a top, and leaping into the air to smother you with its spiky protrusions. You can counter this with the Bump Reaction Command, followed by Meteor Strike, in which Sora will spike the star into the ground, hurting both its face and its feelings. Morning Stars have a 12% chance to drop Power Crystals, and a 5% chance for both Mega Potions and Serenity Stones. Their best location is the Restoration Site before you go to Space Paranoids for the first time, where there are three, and afterwards it's the Ravine Trail with 5. Here we have the Fiery Globe, native to Agrabah, which are actually, for the most part, just minding their own goddamn business until you show up. From what I can tell, they won't even attack you unless you bother them, and their only attack is this measly little tackle. Otherwise, they are simply vibing. But that's literally it. Obviously, don't use fire on them unless you're big on wasting time. The Fire Globes predictably drop Blazing Gems at 4% per kill. The main city of Agrabah is always their best spot, with about 28 showing up in the early game and about 18 later on. The Icy Cube is slightly less of a pushover than its fiery sibling, also first appearing in Agrabah, but less inclined to sit around until you kill it. Its attack is pretty much just an ice variant of the globe, but it'll use it on you without being provoked. Don't bother using Blizzard on it, and despite its typing, fire actually isn't super effective against it, and both it and the globe have a resistance to thunder, so go figure. Icy Cubes are an easy source of Frost Gems, which they drop at 4% per kill. Their best spot early on is the Bazaar with 13 spawns, and later on it's the Cave Entrance with 7. Making its full-bodied return from KH1 is the Fat Bandit, somehow outliving the standard bandits with more stable BMIs. Still native to Agrabah, the Fat Bandit is pretty much its same big bone self, although it's a bit less vicious in its spitting attack, and you also can't strike its belly during inhalation for damage or different drops this go-around. It still has its Fire Breath attack, as well as a new move it uses at lower HP, where it charges a Flame Punch for about 9 years before blasting it into the floor. New to KH2, the Fat Bandits are now entirely immune to fire spells, and they're also susceptible to the Full Swing Reaction Command like the Large Body. Fat Bandits drop Blaze Gems at a 12% chance, Ethers at 10%, and Serenity Gems at 4%. Their best location and spawn rate remains unchanged throughout the game, with 7 appearing in the main city area of Agrabah. Replacing the Bandits in KH2 Agrabah are the Luna Bandits, which are just big fans of Psyax. It's fittingly pretty reminiscent of its plain counterpart, although it lacks a ranged attack, instead sometimes opting to spin around while doing a goddamn handstand. Otherwise, it dashes around, swings its sword while walking towards you, and does a jumping slash attack. I like his stupid little elf shoes. That's about all I've got for these guys. They have an 8% chance of dropping a Power Stone and a 4% chance of dropping a Bright Stone. Before the Battle of 1k Heartless, they're actually only found in the Cerberus Cup in Olympus after your first visit to Agrabah. Afterwards, they're found in the Bazaar of Agrabah, where you can find 8. Some of the spookiest Heartless KH2 has to offer, in my opinion, are the gargoyle statues from Beast Castle coming in both the Knight and Warrior variants. Visually, they're just big spiky dudes, but the context of how they appear is just generally upsetting. You never know for sure if you're walking past gothic art or gothic art that wants to cleave you in half and steal your soul. Both types are immune to magic and wield different weapons, a sword for the knight and an axe for the warrior. The knight uses a simple upward and downward slash attack, a triple slash move, and a charging slash, while the warrior will fling its axe, do a double slash attack, and a big spinny move, because what else is there to do in this castle? These guys are actually controlled by the Possessor, the same ghastly ripoff that took over the Thresholder boss, and you can use the Release Reaction command to insta-kill the statue by driving the Possessor out of it. This is easiest to achieve after blocking one of the statue's attacks, whereupon it'll freeze up and give you the command prompt. Both statues have the same drop rates, with Dark Gems dropping at a 10% chance per kill and Energy Shards at 4%. Their best spot pre-1k Heartless is the West Hall with 3 each, and later on it's the Courtyard with 4. 
The last of our vanilla K-1 veterans hailing from Halloween Town is the White Knight, still as lanky and stanky of a bastard as he was in 2002. It's pretty much the same guy, like, he said he would change, but he hasn't really changed at all, still leaps around, still does his janky spinning move, still smells like dead garbage. He's also added this new move where he spins at you vertically like a buzzsaw, so look out for that. This mummified Heartless has an 8% chance of dropping a Lucid Stone and a 4% chance of dropping a Bright Stone. Before the Battle of 1k Heartless, he's best found on Curly Hill with 10 spawns, and after the battle, he's best found in the Halloween Town Square with 2. One of the least common Heartless in the game is the Graveyard, first appearing on your second Halloween Town trip. Harkening back to those gargoyles, the Graveyard just opts for wielding both an axe and a dagger, like Porque no los dos, right? At least that's when it's in its jack-o'-lantern form. The graveyard swaps between this and its namesake, the grave form, where it floats around menacingly and mainly attacks by having these little blobby ghosts circling it. But its more aggressive form is pumpkin mode, in which it'll headbutt you and slash at you with its variety pack weapons. The graveyard has a 12% chance of dropping a lucid stone, a 10% chance of dropping an ether, and a 4% chance of dropping a serenity shard. Its best spot is the curly hell, where five will spawn. Predating the Toy Trooper from KH3 is the Toy Soldier from KH2, which goes to show that James Cricket is a very creative taxonomist. Native to Halloween Town and relegating itself to Candy Cane Lane in Christmas Town, the Toy Soldier is very similar to the aforementioned Graveyard. In fact, both of their alternate forms are basically the exact same pumpkin slasher villain. But when in Soldier Mode, the Toy Soldier shows off his best Clayton cosplay by shooting you in the fucking face, Miss Porter. Toy Soldiers commonly drop Lucid Stones at a 12% rate, and rarely drop Ethers at a 10% rate, and Serenity Stones at a 4% rate. It's best to encounter these Heartless on Candy Cane Lane in Halloween Town, with one spawning before the 1000 Heartless battle, and four after. Here we have this Pokémon from the 2010s, the Timeless River-based Aeroplane, which actually does little to associate itself with the Aero element, so maybe it's just British. These types of Heartless always raise biological questions for me, like, is the entire thing organic matter? Does the little guy get out of his plane after his shift, if he manages to survive that long? Or was he a plane from the start? If he's not, is he still an aeroplane if he's able to remove himself? And like, sometimes Heartless pilot gummy ships, but sometimes the ships are Heartless themselves? So many questions, way too much time. Anyway, it's just a plane, it shoots at you and dashes around. Aeroplanes drop Frost Stones at an 8% rate and Bright Stones at a 4% rate. Before the 1000 Heartless fight, it's best to encounter them at the building site in Timeless River with 4 spawns, and after the fight is the scene of the fire and the pier, also with 4 spawns. Here he is, the vehicular menace to society, the Hot Rod. A veritable advertisement for bicycles, this Heartless is native to Timeless River and has indeed been a timeless pain in our collective ass for the past 16 years. How disturbing is it that the Hot Rod is nearly old enough to have a state-issued driver's license? The answer is very, because it is road rage personified. I think this guy is up there with the Crimson Jazz for the most hateable Heartless within the community, which is understandable. But unlike the Jazz, the Hot Rod can just decide it doesn't really feel like being hit anymore and becomes invincible to physical damage as it dashes around and ruins its safe driver score. And as Kingdom Hearts players, we hate it when the X button doesn't work. It'll also bite you with its grill and punch you with its wheels and leave a big tire track on your face. I will gladly see it in Hell where we will fight an eternal battle. Hot Rods drop Frost Stones at a 12% rate, High Potions at a 10% rate, and Serenity Shards at a 4% rate. They're best found in the Timeless River with 3 spawning at the scene of the fire in the early game and 5 spawning at the wharf in the late game. The Hot Rod has a cavern variant called the Mad Ride, which is the same as the Hot Rod except Guy Fieri now. Mad Rides only spawn in the depth room of the cavern, 9 will spawn here, all with a 12% chance of dropping a Remembrance Gem and a 4% chance of dropping a Serenity Gem. Next is this big centaur boy known as the Assault Rider, famous for its legs somehow supporting the rest of its body. Home to the Land of Dragons, there's talk that this Heartless was originally supposed to appear in KH1 but didn't fit in any of the worlds, although I literally can't find any sources to confirm that, so take it with a grain of salt. A grain of salt which is likely generated by me when I get trapped in this bastard's big windmill attack that would make Don Quixote quake in his boots. The Rider also has a charge attack, a stab move with his big, uh, stab stick, a slash attack, and a front-facing explosion move that it'll use at lower HP. Assault Riders have a 12% chance of dropping Dark Stones, a 10% chance of dropping High Potions, and a 4% chance of dropping Serenity Shards. They're best found in the Land of Dragons, with 4 spawning on the Mountain Trail, and 7 spawning in the Antechamber before and after the 1000 Heartless fights, respectively. Another Land of Dragons native is the Nightwalker, which my uncultured ass thought was just, like, a zombie or a vampire of some sort, until I looked it up and realized it's actually based on the legendary Chinese creature called the Jiangxi, which is pretty much a zombie or a vampire after all, so. They're definitely one of the creepier Cage 2 Heartless in my opinion, and they're more like fast World War Z zombies and not the slow Walking Dead zombies. They primarily attack animalistically with claw swipes and tackle moves. 
They also spawn a little differently than other Heartless, where it's closed and a little sticky note on its head first appear lit on blue fire and then the rest of the Heartless follows. We love a flashy entrance. It's also immune to Blizzard for whatever reason. Nightwalkers fittingly have a 10% chance of dropping Dark Stones and a little less fittingly a 4% chance of dropping Energy Shards. Like the Assault Riders, they're best found in the Land of Dragons, with 6 spawning on the Mountain Trail in the early game, but 10 spawning in the Imperial Square in the late. Check out this big doof. It's the Bolt Tower, built in honor of Disney's 2008 movie Bolt. I don't know guys, what the fuck am I supposed to say about this? It's a big cartoon lightning rod, so you know, don't cast thunder on it. It likes to appear alongside rapid thrusters and it first shows up in the Land of Dragons. Even though he is a big long boy, you need to aim for its head to deal any real damage. It attacks with a sad little headbutt, a large body-esque shockwave, a little flash from its antenna, and a move where it traps Sora in a laser thing. You can also use a reaction command against it called Bolt Reversal to reverse its bolt, also damaging other Heartless in the immediate area. Bolt Towers drop lightning shards at a rate of 10% and energy shards at a rate of 4%. Three of these guys spawn at the checkpoint and in the Imperial Square in the Land of Dragons before the mid-game, and seven in the Savannah in the Pride Lands after. Look at this cool guy, it's the Magnum Loader. What a name. To its credit, it's probably the coolest unicyclist I can think of. These guys first appear during the Light Cycle minigame in Space Paranoids, and they actually come in a variety of fun flavors, though only the red ones appear outside of the minigame. The name is apparently a mistranslation or a reference to an enemy called the Magna Rotor from Final Fantasy VI, which is also a unicyclist and is now the coolest unicyclist I can think of. It attacks with a little backflip move and a decently fast charging attack. Sora can use the Quick Blade Reaction Command against it, which always seem to be one of the less frequent ones in my experience, but the prompt will show up when it's charging up to attack you. Magnum Loaders have an 8% chance of dropping Lucid Gems and a 4% chance of dropping Bright Gems. They're best found in Space Paranoids before and after the 1000 Heartless fight, with 6 spawning in the Data Space and 10 on the Solar Sailor, respectively. Next are the grunt enemies of Space Paranoids, the Strafer. These guys aren't super threatening, but they tend to appear in groups to beat the shit out of you on behalf of Sark and the MCP. As the name implies, they strafe around their prey and attack with electric moves, though they do take normal damage from Thunder. They attack with a simple energy shot, a quick spinning move, and a homing ring attack. They also do headstands when you hit them. Strafers drop lightning crystals at an 8% rate and bright crystals at a 4% rate. They're best found in the canyon area of Space Paranoids, with 9 spawning in the early game, but only 8 spawning afterwards. One of the biggest and most dangerous non-boss Heartless in this game is the Devastator, this quadrupedal beast from Space Paranoids. The Purple Menace will switch between an airborne and grounded formation and has different attacks for each. In the air, it'll shoot six energy blasts at you from afar, swat at you with its rave glow sticks, fire off a big homing ball as it floats in place, charge at you with a low spinning attack, and discharge a dangerous amount of electricity as it transforms into its ground form. On land, it'll fire off three homing blasts and do a close-range battering attack. Quite a lot in its arsenal, as you can see. Devastators, being one of the strongest Heartless, have appropriately great drops, with Lightning Crystals dropping at a 12% rate, Elixirs at a 5% rate, and Serenity Stones at a 4% rate. Only one will spawn in the IO Tower hallway on the first Space Paranoids visit, but five on the Solar Sailor on subsequent visits. The Cavern of Remembrance variant, the Reckless, can only be found in the Engine Chamber, with nine spawning. They have a 12% chance of dropping Remembrance Crystals, and a 4% chance of dropping Serenity Gems. The first of our Heartless native to the Pride Lands is the Living Bone, which will ambush you as soon as you enter the Elephant Graveyard on your first visit. Something about their name clarifying the fact that they're alive makes me uneasy. They sometimes appear with the Shaman Heartless riding atop them, making for a very sweet symbiotic relationship between the two. These dinosaur weirdos attack with a big glowy tailspin move, a simple bite attack, and a tantrum where it creates a few shockwaves. The Living Bones spawn without heads when accompanied by shamans, so you obviously won't be seeing it doing much biting when that's the case. Speaking of, when not being ridden by a shaman, you can often counter their bite attack with the Rodeo Reaction Command, allowing you to, what else, ride around on the Living Bone, dealing damage to anything else in your path. You can then slam the Living Bone into the ground with the finishing Grand Cross Reaction Command. Geez, who put religion in my Kingdom Hearts 2 final mix? Living Bones have a 12% chance of dropping Frost Crystals, a 5% chance of dropping Elixirs, and a 4% chance of dropping Serenity Stones. They can best be found in the Pride Lands, with 6 spawning in the Savannah before the 1000 Heartless fight, and 5 in the Elephant Graveyard afterwards. What if Rafiki, but dark and edgy? Introducing the Shaman, another Pride Lands native. As a magic user, the Shaman is naturally resistant, although not immune to offensive magic attacks. As mentioned before, the Shaman can spawn on top of Living Bones and can use most of their attacks from atop their steed as well. 
They fight with simple scratch attacks and blue fire-based magic that they can spawn on top of you, as well as a move where they'll surround you in a ring of fire, sort of reminiscent of the Invisible's signature move from KH1. When this happens, you can use the Dispel Reaction command to both get rid of the flames and damage surrounding enemies. Lastly, the Shaman can reduce itself to just a mask and float around, dealing damage to the touch. Shamans have a 10% chance of dropping Power Gems, a 4% chance of dropping Energy Crystals, and a 1% chance of dropping the Shaman's Relic, one of the better non-synthesis weapons for Dolan you can get on a casual playthrough, especially before the 1000 Heartless fight. Speaking of which, 7 will spawn before the fight and 6 after in the Wastelands area of the Pride Lands. Necromancers are their Cavern of Remembrance variants, with 7 spawning in the depths. They have a 10% chance of dropping Remembrance Stones, a 4% chance of dropping Serenity Stones, and a 1% chance of dropping the Shaman's Relic Plus weapon, which is far worse given its availability. Up next is the Airborne Pugilist, the Aerial Knocker, the only Heartless to appear on pay-per-view. These guys are another Pride Lands Heartless, because when I think of the Pride Lands, I think of parrots with boxing gloves. They attack by punching, if you could believe it, with 5 hit hook combos, a triple jab, and a big charging punch. They got a reaction command that Sora can only use in lion form called Rapid Blow, which can be used when the knocker is charging up its big punch. Aerial knockers have an 8% chance of dropping power gems and a 4% chance of dropping bright gems. After completing Pride Lands the first time, there's only one in the Wastelands, and after the 1000 Heartless fight, you can find four of them in the jungle. Their Cabin of Remembrance variants, the Aerial Champ, have an 8% chance of dropping Remembrance Stones and a 4% chance of dropping Serenity Stones. A whole 16 can be found in the Engine Chamber. Next are the three Heartless that debuted in Chain of Memories, returning for KH2. First is the Tornado Step, which first appears either during a post-Barbosa trip to Port Royal or during your second Olympus visit, whichever you do first. They attack with a jumping swipe move and a fittingly Tornado-esque flying spin attack. The latter can be interrupted by using the Tornado Ride Reaction Command, in which Sora will grab the enemy's... whatever you want to call that, and fly around like a carnival ride that has passed zero inspections. This will damage both the Tornado Step and any nearby enemies. Tornado Steps have an 8% chance of dropping Blazing Stones and a 4% chance of dropping Bright Stones. They can best be found in Port Royal, with 8 spawning in the Moonlight Nook in the early game and a whopping 14 in the Cave of Dead Passage in the late game. Next in the Calm Trio is the Crescendo, also known as the Loudmouth in subsequent appearances. It first appears on your second trip to Olympus Coliseum. I guess it's a horn. They made a Heartless out of a horn. It's arguably the bard of the Heartless army, it's only got one actual attack where it swings itself at you, but it's better known for being able to heal both itself and other Heartless, so it's kind of a more dangerous green requiem in that way. You can take advantage of this move with the Healing Stomp Reaction Command, which heals both Sora and his party members. On top of the Crescendo's healing abilities, it can also even summon additional Heartless into the battle, so ideally you'll want to target these guys first. Crescendos will give you a 6% chance at a Blazing Crystal and a 3% chance of a Bright Crystal. Your best bet at finding them is in the Cave of the Dead Passage, where 24 can be fought. Our last calm veteran is the Creeper Plant, who isn't creepy, he's just lonely. They're first encountered on your first trip to Olympus Coliseum. The plants are as good as a mobile, as they're rooted in the ground and primarily attack by pelting three seeds at you from afar. It can also respond to your own attacks by sending its roots up to stab you in the feet. You can take advantage of that with the Root Ravager command, which allows Sora to uproot the Heartless, exposing its spaghetti legs as it hangs its head in sadness. Their only attack from now until you put it out of its misery is Vine Whip. Creeper plants have an 8% chance of dropping a Power Shard and a 4% chance at a Bright Shard. Before taking out 1000 Heartless, there are 4 at the Cave of the Dead entrance and the Valley of the Dead. Their best post-1k Heartless spot is the Hinterlands in Halloween Town. If you enter from Christmas Town, 2 will spawn, but 3 will spawn if you come from the graveyard. Go figure. Imagine sinking so low in life that there's really nothing better for you to do than die in the name of Maleficent. Introducing the Armored Knight, most famous for being a casualty of war. Essentially the poster corpse of the Battle of 1000 Heartless, these guys first show up just before your first trip to Space Paranoids and are obviously fought in droves during the aforementioned battle. They're obviously more threatening in large groups than one-on-one, -on -one, but even still they're pretty easily slaughtered by the Rising Sun Reaction Command, during which Sora will just swoosh down into a crowd five times and myrtleize a bunch of them all at once. When they're not busy being killed, they attack with simple sword moves, including a breakdance spin attack, a standing spin attack, and a downward stab move. Armored Knights have an 8% chance to drop a Dark Crystal, and a 4% chance to drop a Bright Crystal. Before their worst hour, you can find 11 at the Bailey. After the dust settles, you can find 13 at the Restoration Site. A surveillance camera! Here we have an accessory to the murders of the Armored Knights, that is, they served as additional murderees during the 1000 Heartless battle, the Surveillance Robot, retconned to be called Watchers in subsequent games. The robot floats around and attacks with its little razor blade piece. It also takes pot shots with two laser attacks, one where it summons a bunch of red ones, and one where it sends two white ones directly at you. 
The latter move can be interrupted by using the snag command in which Sora grabs the robot. You could just leave it at that and release the little guy after a brief hug, or force it to murder its comrades with the Sparkle Ray follow-up command, which releases a devastating 360-degree laser. Surveillance robots will give you a 6% chance at a lightning gem and a 3% chance at a bright gem. 14 can be found in the corridors before the battle, and 6 at the restoration site afterwards. Returning from KH1 Final Mix is the Neo Shadow, which isn't really the mini-boss that it used to be, but the game does hold them back from you until after the 1000 Heartless battle, where they'll appear in almost every combat-focused world. Instead of the multi-layered mind games they played last time, Neo Shadows are more straightforward now, attacking with simple scratches, a horizontal buzzsaw attack, and that mid-air dive tackle from last time. They have potentially the most obscure reaction command in the game, and full disclosure, I've had this game since 2006 and platinumed it on PS3 and 4, and I don't think I'd ever used it. I spent a long time trying to get it, and eventually just asked my friend Chain if he could get the footage, and it didn't take him much less time to get it himself. But here it is, Wind Dance, which I guess you have to use when a Neo Shadow is jumping towards you to close distance. It's not even that cool, but I'm willing to put money on it being the reaction command that most people complete last, if ever. Neo Shadows have an 8% chance to drop Lucid Crystals, and a 4% chance to drop Bright Crystals. Their best spot is the Cave of the Dead Passage in Olympus with 14 spawns. Alright, now for the Mushroom 13, KH2's answer to the friendly Mushroom Heartless from KH1, although to call some of these friendly may be inaccurate considering some of the minigames they put you through. We'll just go from number 1 to 13. Mushroom number 1 appears at Memory Skyscraper in the world that never was, and you actually need to beat the game in order for it to spawn. All of the Mushroom 13 have some sort of connection or reference to their corresponding humans in the organization. In addition to appearing where you first fight Xemnas in this game, Mushroom 1 is one of the biggest mushrooms given that Xemnas is the leader of the organization. It also features the usage of the Reversal Reaction Command, which is used in the final Xemnas battle to avoid the little nothingness spaghetti strings. Once you begin the game against Number 1, the goal is to get as many hits on him as you can in 30 seconds. You can only do this when the Mushroom is facing away from you, and to arrange that you'll want to use the Reversal and Quick Slide Reaction Commands to get behind him. What complicates this is that the Mushroom will sometimes reversal in response, faking you out and knocking you back, but most importantly, wasting your time. The key is to wait for the reversal command to change into Quick Slide, which has a smaller window, but is much more useful at immobilizing the Mushroom. Considering you want to deal as many hits as possible, I'd recommend going into Final Form for this. Also, for every Mushroom but numbers 4 and 13, there are 6 ranks, ranging from E to S, based on your performance in each minigame and corresponding drop rates for each rank. Bear in mind, you only need to hit B rank for each Mushroom in order to consider them satisfied for the purposes of getting the Proof of Peace. So for Mushroom 1, B rank is 70 hits and S rank is the max, 99. I'll have these thresholds marked on screen in place of their drop rates for reasons I'll explain in this next paragraph, which is starting... right... now. All of the Mushroom 13 have almost the exact same drop rates, so we'll just cover that now for the sake of brevity. First off, the odd-numbered Mushrooms like number 1 here have a chance of dropping different staff weapons for Donald depending on how well you do. For the even-numbered Mushrooms, it's shields for Goofy. I'm not going to bother putting up and talking through the percentages for each and every rank because we'd be here for way too long, so I instead suggest you check out the KH Wiki for the nitty-gritty on the stats here. But, general rule of thumb, the only way to guarantee drops for the best Mushroom staff and shield, the Premium and Ultimate Mushrooms respectively, is to complete each minigame at the S rank. There's only a 10% chance for those weapons at the A rank. Additionally, the Mushrooms will always drop a Tranquility item for each rank you clear, and that stacks. So a Shard for E rank, a Stone for D rank, a Gem for C, and Crystals for B, A, and S. Okay, I think we're finally done laying the groundwork for these guys. Mushroom number 2 appears where you fight the experiment in Christmas Town after your second visit to the world. Just like Zigbar, Mushroom 2 attacks with projectiles, which you'll need to deflect in order to satisfy it. The more you deflect and avoid, the better you do, so any sort of abilities like Aerial Dodge and Reflect are going to be your friend here. The latter is probably your best bet so long as you can keep your MP high enough. For that, you might want to consider bringing Elixirs or Summoning Stitch to supply you with MP. Facing the Mushroom is going to help increase the odds that you cleanly reflect its shots back at it, so keep that in mind. You'll want to dodge or deflect 80 shots for B rank and the max of 99 for S rank. Mushroom number 3 shows up after defeating Zaldan at the bridge in B's castle. Fittingly, they both fly around in this area. I guess number 3 being able to fly could be a nod to Zaldan's wind-based prowess. Number 3 glides around the bridge, shitting out these purple... friendliness pellets. The goal is to collect as many of those as you can, which is simple at first, until the Mushroom starts flying away from you at light speed. Your best bet will be to equip as many draw abilities as possible, including through the Follow the Wind keychain. Coincidentally, the keychain with the word Wind in it is the key to beating the Zaldan Mushroom. Using Quick Run or your own Glide skill can also help you in keeping up with the Mushroom's pace. You'll need to collect 450 orbs for B rank and 500 for S. 
Number 4, the Vexen Mushroom appears at the Palace Gate in the Land of Dragons after your first visit. Like its Nobody counterpart, Number 4 employs the usage of replicas to do the bulk of the fighting for it. For whatever reason, the game doesn't really use the 6 rank system for this mushroom, instead offering 4 different performance grades for Mushroom 4. So you'll get the best prizes for clearing the minimum requirement for satisfying Number 4, which is hitting 85 of its clones without getting hit, although you can still very well hit all 100 of them, but for no added benefit. Since you need to not only hit as many replicas as possible, but also avoid being touched even once, Wisdom Form is a natural answer to this dilemma. The quick shot Sora attacks with in Wisdom Form can take care of the mushrooms at a distance, and equipping the Fatal Crest Keychain can apply Berserk Charge during your MP charge time, meaning you won't have to worry about that slower combo finisher so long as you keep your MP pink by curing as often as possible. Meanwhile, as you're pelting your fungal pursuers, just keep skating away from them in a circle, and you should clear the requirement no problem. Number 5 is the biggest of the Mushroom 13, a reference to Lexius's size and physical strength. It appears in the Treasure Room in Agrabah's Cave of Wonders after the first visit. Despite its girth, Number 5 is potentially the easiest Mushroom to satisfy. The goal is to reduce its HP to zero quicker than it's able to regenerate it back. There are methods to do okay at this throughout the game, but you're best off just waiting until you get Final Form, throwing on Bond of Flame, and using Faraga on it to melt its HP. Dropping the bar to zero within 10 seconds gets you B rank, and doing it in 3 seconds or less nets you S rank. Mushroom number 6 can be found in the Underworld Caverns Atrium after your first visit. As the Zexian Mushroom, this guy also makes use of clones and illusions in his minigame. Not unlike the number 4 Mushroom, the goal here is to defeat all of the clones as quickly as possible, though you don't have to worry about them fighting back this time. Mushrooms will spawn in different formations, but fittingly always in a group of 6. These various formations kinda call for different tactics, but honestly, Final Form and Thunder is gonna be an easy go-to method to dispatch these guys. Getting rid of all of the Cloak Schemers within 45 seconds will get you B rank, while doing so in 31 seconds or less will get you S rank. Here we have the Syax Mushroom, the indisposable number 7, found in the Twilight Town Tunnelway. Just like his Nobody counterpart, number 7 is potentially the most physically aggressive of the group and essentially exists in a constant state of Berserk mode. The aim of the game here is to just defeat the Mushroom as quickly as you can, though this is complicated by it being knocked away if you attack it directly. For that reason, indirect attacks or attacks delivered from a distance are the best way to get a high score. The best strategy seems to be going into final form and spamming Reflect since that's not actually a direct attack. Doing this will allow you to defeat the Mushroom pretty quickly. The required score for B rank is 10 seconds or less, and for S rank it's 3 seconds or less. And now for the dreaded Mushroom number 8, the counterpart to fan-favorite Axel is easily the most universally despised member of the Mushroom 13. Located outside the Mysterious Tower, number 8 is basically just the rare truffle from KH1, except this time Neverland's Endless Super Glide isn't here to help you. The more times you're able to bop it into the air without letting it touch the ground, the better your rank will be. Sort of similar to the problem with Mushroom number 4, going for simple combos here will ruin your attempt since Sora's finishers take too long to consistently keep the Mushroom airborne. So again, the key here is to make your combo endless with Berserk Charge and staying mindful of keeping your MP bar pink. Naturally, taking off any MP haste abilities will make this easier to accomplish. On top of that, having the longest Keyblade possible will help extend your reach, and Fenrir is your best option for that. If you can manage to juggle the little bastard 85 times without appearing on the local news, you'll satisfy number 8. For S rank, you'll need to do it 99 times. Have fun with that. Mushroom number 9 appears at Radiant Garden's Castle Gate after the Battle of 1000 Heartless. As the designated Demix Mushroom, it appears at the same place you fought Demix for the second and final time, and you could argue its propensity to spin around could be a reference to Demix's association with music and dance. This time, the goal is to keep the Mushroom spinning by hitting it. Of course, taking too much time between your hits will cause it to stop spinning. Once again, Berserk Charge is going to be useful in keeping your combo endless while your MP is recharging. Going Final Form also can't hurt since you'll be able to close any distance you create a little bit faster. For rank B, you'll need to hit it 75 times, and for rank S, it'll be another 99. Next up is Mushroom 10, or X. Some say Kai, but the meaning is the same. Number 10, the Luxord Mushroom, fittingly appears in Port Royal at Moonlight Nook after the second visit. Just like in Luxord's boss fight, this mushroom shuffles around amongst a bunch of fakes. In that way, it's also pretty reminiscent of the Black Ballad Heartless from KH1. You need to defeat the real one among the fake clones as quickly as possible. I'd say it's easier to keep track of the genuine item this time around, but I won't be mad at you if you decide to be a cheese ball and repeatedly pause the game during the shuffle. I would. Chain didn't because he's not a cheese ball, and that's fine, we still get along. Regardless of your cheese factor, using Final Form to dish out as much damage as possible to the real mushroom will be key in lowering its HP in the fastest manner. B rank is achieved by doing this in 55 seconds, and S rank is within 35 seconds. Mushroom number 11 shows up in Timeless River at the Waterway after you've dealt with all the Pete-related shenanigans. I guess the Marluxia connection here is that they both utilize a number counter, except this time the numbers are above his head instead of yours. In a fascinating shakeup, the goal here is to hit the mushroom a bunch of times very quickly. Look, I'm sorry, it's been a very long script. 
Best bet for this guy is going Wisdom for him. You can get pretty far just shooting him from a reasonable distance, even without any special ability preparation, but I figure going Berserk Charge yet again to nullify those finishing shots might make the process a little bit faster. You'll want to drop his overhead counter to zero within 19 seconds to get B rank, and within 15 seconds for S. The last of the actual minigame mushrooms is number 12, located outside the old mansion in Twilight Town. This mushroom likes to create clones of itself and teleport around, which is reminiscent of Larxene's same habit from her boss fights. Number 12 will multiply and float around the structures in the mansion's front yard, and it's your job to hit as many of them as you can within a minute. If you'd believe it, going into wisdom form and taking advantage of Berserk Charge is a good way to keep constant pressure on the mushroom clones. Just slide around the center of the area and spin your camera around to keep track of where the next mushroom is going to pop up. Defeating 40 of the clones within the time limit will net you B rank, and that's 50 clones for S rank. And our last Heartless in this compendium is Mushroom number 13, which is truly the friendliest of the friendly Heartless, as it literally just shows up to give you stuff and then kindly fucks off. It only appears one time in the Great Maw at Radiant Garden after the other 12 Mushrooms have been sufficiently impressed by your degree of patience. Once you've beaten the game, any and all Mushrooms that you've managed to satisfy will appear here, and if you've completed each minigame, the Roxas Room himself will descend via a beam of light and gift you the Winner's Proof keychain, as well as the Proof of Peace, which will be reflected by Sora either gaining or changing the color of his Burger King crown. Alright, that's enough of the Heartless, time for the much more frightening menaces introduced in KH2. Finally, content about the undead pirates from Port Royal. There are three different variants, all of which are based on characters from the movie, and they appear on both of your story visits to Port Royal. Pirate A here is based on Bosun, Pirate B on Twig, and Pirate C on Jacoby. Bosun dual wields hatchets and can be evaded with the back shuffle reaction command and then high counter, which deals a lot of damage. Twig here carries a big crossbow, or a gun if you live in Japan, and he can be countered with the Return Fire Reaction Command in which Sora simply just deflects his bullets back at him. Lastly, Jacoby lacks a Reaction Command and instead fights by throwing bombs and wielding a dagger. As the game makes abundantly clear, none of these guys can be damaged unless they're exposed to the moonlight. When they are, though, offensive magic is particularly effective against them. Blizzard will freeze them in place, Thunder will make them all jittery, and Fire will send them meandering about as their bones smoke up the battlefield. These guys all actually have different drop rates as well. Bosun has a 10% chance to drop a potion, Twig has a 10% chance to drop an ether, and Jacoby has a 5% chance to drop a high potion. Alright, now onto the nobodies. The first of either Heartless or Nobody we see in Cage 2 is the Dusk, these slippery, zippery creeps who also apparently serve as some form of punishment within the organization as Axel hints that human members can be turned into these things for being disobedient. Gotta say, that alone would keep me on the straight and narrow because a life as a Dusk does not seem like a life worth living. It does seem like they may have kept some sort of communication ability if the prologue is anything to go by. Or the manga. A Dusk first shows up on the first day in the simulated Twilight Town when the gang tries to figure out why they're have been stolen, although you can't actually damage it until later. The Dusks move like gross little snakes wearing jumpsuits and attack with feet strikes and this upside-down air-walking hand thing. You can pretty frequently use the reversal command to outmaneuver them, momentarily causing them to enter a visible state of distress and confusion. I should mention, outside of event battles, you can't actually fight any nobodies in the field until after your second visit to each world. Most don't appear at all until you visit whichever world their corresponding organization member is meddling in. So all of their best and repeatable farming locations are going to be labeled as post-1000 Heartless. In the case of the Dusk, their best spot is the underground concourse in Twilight Town where Nine will spawn. They've got a 10% chance of dropping Twilight Shards. Obligatory aw man. While the Dusk is the first nobody we're introduced to, they're more akin to the Soldier if we're doing comparisons to the Heartless. The true shadow of the nobody army is the Creeper, and while it's definitely the least dangerous of the species, it's still more of a threat than the Shadows. That being said, it was cursed with an unfortunate body structure, and they're relegated to sorta of just awkwardly crawling around. These guys first appear during the Twilight Thorn boss battle at the end of the Dive to the Heart. Just like the Dusk, the Creeper is a master contortionist as it can change into swords, a shield, a mask, and a spear. Their most frequent attacks include transforming into a sword and swiping wildly or stabbing into the ground in their spear form. They tend to show up in large groups, and they're by far the most common nobody and one of the most frequent spawns in the game, second only to rapid thrusters. Creepers have an 8% chance of dropping dense shards. These guys are perfect for leveling up final form due to their frequency and their low HP, and the best spot to do this is not Skyway in the world it never was, where 33 of them will spawn. Next up is the Dragoon, the only known entities who have Zaldan as their favorite organization member. I mean, even that might not be true, they just they just work for the guy. They might be Marluxia fans, there's really no way of knowing. The Dragoons first appear during the second visit to Beast Castle. Also, from here on out, all the nobodies will be associated with an actual organization member who lords over them. They're also all named after Final Fantasy job classes. In this case, the Dragoon is named after the group of the same name that first appeared in Final Fantasy 2 and in 3 as a job. They're typically powerful, lance-wielding characters, and the nobodies fit right in with that. Just like Zaldan, they dart around and attack by swinging their lances and stabbing it into the ground, which is actually how they initially spawn in. And again, like in the battle against Zaldan, you can stock up on Learn Reaction Commands and then use them with the Jump Command, plunging down onto the Dragoons to see how they like it. 
The most likely answer is that they do not like it as it deals a great deal of damage. Dragoons drop dense shards at a 12% chance and they also have a rare drop of the nobody lands for Donald with a 1% chance. Best spot to find dragoons is either the star chamber in the mysterious tower where there are four, or the transport to remembrance though different batches of nobodies may spawn there in its place. Next are the Assassins, controlled by who else but the organization's very own contract killer, Axel. Much like Axel's early motives, it's very unclear what the exact fuck the Assassin is supposed to be. I'm just gonna settle on Spiky Guy. They first appeared during the last day in the simulated Twilight Town. The Assassins are sort of reminiscent of Shadows in that they have the ability to sink into the ground, but they're like, semi-vulnerable in this form, so it's kind of a half-assed attempt. Sorry, half-ass-assed. In this state, your attacks will phase right through it, but if its spines are peeking up from the floor high enough, you can hit them and pull it out of its subterranean state. They mainly attack by whipping their spiny arms at you, either rapidly from under the floor or with one big swipe when above ground. When their HP gets low enough, they'll also do a self-destruct move. The assassins have a reaction command which is exclusive to Sora because they didn't animate Roxas doing it, called Failsafe, in which Sora grabs the assassin and eats it into the ground before it can pull off its self-destruct move. Assassins drop Twilight Gems at a 12% chance and are best farmed at Ruin and Creation's Passage, where there are 12. Up next are the minions controlled by Roxas, the Samurais, which for whatever reason first appeared during the event where you protect the gate on the first Radiant Garden visit. Just like Roxas, they fittingly wield two swords. Unsurprisingly, they exclusively use these twin blades to attack you, either with a flurry of slashes or sudden and strong swipes. When the Samurai kneels, you have the opportunity to use Dual Stance, one of my favorite reaction commands in the game. The world around you freezes, and one of the four command menu slots will randomly display the end for a short window of time. If you get there first, you kill the Samurai. If it moves quicker, you get a blade in the face. Samurais have a 12% chance of dropping dense gems, and they're most frequent at Knott's Skyway in the world it never was, where 7 will spawn. Here we have the Sniper, number 2 Zigbar enthusiast after Bioroxis. Like their master, they wield arrow guns and have the ability to manipulate space itself. They first appear during an event battle when the party runs into Zigbar messing around in the Land of Dragons Palace. They actually have a little eye patch painted onto their helmets to help Zigbar feel less self-conscious. Unsurprisingly, the snipers employ their guns in all of their attacks, either by just hitting you with the thing or firing off its red energy bolts indicated by the little laser sight that extends from the tip of the gun. Just like in the battle against Zigbar, Sora can take advantage of the Warp Sniper Reaction Command to teleport in front of one of the snipers' bolts and knock it back at them, dealing a considerable amount of damage. Snipers drop dense stones at a 12% chance, and their best spot is either the Transport to Remembrance with 10 or the Hall of Empty Melodies in the World It Never Was with 8. Without a doubt, the Grunt Nobody with the lowest approval rating is the Dancer, which serves as backups for Demix during his concerts. They first show up after your first Space Paranoids trip on your way to the Battle of 1000 Heartless. I'd wager their unpopularity stems from their ability to just grab Sora and non-consensually dance with him, offering an in-battle cutscene and no way out. This is telegraphed by the Dancer's hands glowing, so, you know, run away or cast some magic before it gets its dirty mitts on you. Outside of that, the dancers typically attack by kicking and performing the national pastime of Cage 2 enemies, spinning around in a circle very quickly. Dancers have a 12% chance of dropping Twilight Stones, and they're best found in the Old Mansion Basement Corridor, where 6 will spawn. Next up are Syax's underpaid bodyguards, the Berserker, which is almost as difficult to spell as it is to fight. These beefy boys wield claymores just like their blue-haired master, and they first appear in the Sandlaw on Sora's first return trip to Twilight Town. Despite being the largest of the common nobodies, these guys are still surprisingly flexible given their tendency to jet up into the sky and cosplay as like, a clock or something? Whatever this is. What's unsurprising though is how strong these guys are. Like the Dragoons, even the way they spawn in can cause damage. They show up separately of their claymores and you can get caught in the crossfire when they summon them over to their hands. The Berserkers attack by flailing their weapons around, charging about, spin diving into the ground, and with something akin to a DM where it essentially fuses with the claymore, chops the ground a bunch of times, follows up with a two-swing combo, and finishes off with a big glowy shockwave move. Thankfully, Sora can actually pull a Yazora here and steal their claymores with the Berserk command, which as you can see, fills Sora's head with thoughts of microtransactions and stale Donald healing memes. You can then sweep up the Berserkers and follow up with a big flippy move called Eclipse a few times, finishing off with the Magnus Storm reaction command. Berserkers drop dense crystals with a 12% chance per kill, and they're best found consistently at Ruin and Creation's Passage in the world it never was, where 8 spawn. Here we've got Luxord's casino employees, the Gamblers, who first show up to cause trouble during your second trip to Port Royal. Gamblers are similar to their master in that they mainly prefer to engage in games of chance as opposed to attacking directly, although they do have a few purely offensive skills. This includes its spinning top move and the attacks it'll use if it goes uninterrupted. Gamblers will attempt to launch an oversized die at you, which you could either deflect back at it or use the stop dice reaction command on. Your reaction command bar will then cycle through X's and O's, and if you press triangle when it displays an O, you'll stun the gambler and win some money. If you land on X, you turn into a die, though you can still hop around and deal damage. This reverts when your drive gauge depletes. Likewise, you'll also be presented with a begin game reaction command, in which the gambler shuffles through cards as your own command menu shuffles through more X's and O's, sort of like the Xemnas battle and cage one final mix. 
Selecting the O yields the same result as the dice game, and selecting an X, you guessed it, turns you into a dumb old card, which again has at least some offensive capabilities, but less so than the die. If you ignore the begin game command, the gambler will surround you with cards that hone in and damage you. Interestingly, when the gambler is floating around, you can see that its cards depict Marluxia, Vexen, Lexius, and Larxene, but not the other people from Castle Oblivion or Luxord, go figure. Gamblers are also famously a good source of leveling up Master Form. If you equip the Drive Converter ability, money drops convert into Drive Orbs. Couple that with any jackpot abilities and you can farm the Gambler's games for a bunch of Drive Orbs which give experience toward leveling up Master Form. Gamblers drop Twilight Shards at a 12% chance as well as the Nobody Guard Shield for Goofy which drops at a 1% chance normally or 3% if you win a game against the Gambler. Their best spot is the Foyer in the Old Mansion with 9 spawns. And finishing off this compendium is the most powerful of the non-boss nobodies, the Sorcerers, fittingly inspired and commanded by Xemnas, first appearing in the world that never was. The Sorcerer is less a master of the nothingness element, instead favoring, like, a bunch of cubes pulled from Nintendo's Virtual Boy console. Predictably, the Sorcerer is immune to all types of offensive magic, though that's nothing a Reflect can't handle. The Sorcerers attack by summoning these angry red squares and surrounding Sora in this U-shaped formation. They'll also retaliate by just clubbing the shit out of you with them. They can also momentarily shield themselves by forming a big wall of those cubes and your attacks will ping right off of them. But that's about it, kind of underwhelming for something this rare and regal. Sorcerers drop the coveted Twilight Crystal at a 12% chance per kill and they're best found either in the Transport to Remembrance if their spawn set is active with 6 spawns or the Knot's Approach in their hometown with 2 spawns. Oh boy, that was a big, big project. Uh, I think if I were to know how many hours that took me, I would feel physically ill, so I'm kind of glad that I don't. You know, YouTube is uh, an interesting uh, game. Uh, the algorithm, the, the powers that be, uh, they don't quite care how long it takes to put something like this out. The research, the footage gathering, the writing, the voiceover, the editing, of course, um, it takes a lot of time, many, many hours. Um, and that's not always reflected, unfortunately, in um, the analytics side of things. That's why I'm asking if you are so inclined, um, if you'd like, you can pledge on Patreon. There are three different tiers. Uh, my patrons are definitely a huge reason uh, as to why I'm able to do this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going full force into this right now, full effort. This is a full-time thing right now. Listen, I want to keep doing this stuff. I'm going to keep doing it so long as I'm able to. Uh, speaking of, I had a couple of my patrons and Discord mods help me out with the script on this. They mostly took um, the like statistics and kind of converted it into sentence format, just saving me a lot of time there. So I want to thank Corin, Fourth Strongest, Frosty, Lady, Lucky, and Power Player for their help. And of course, thank you, Shane, again, for getting the footage of the parts that I just I really don't want to get footage for. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I'm going to kick it to some fan art and the lovely outro arranged by Joey DePerry.